Poder escuchar hoy a Judith Butler es sin duda un privilegio. Sus ideas resultan siempre estimulantes, nos llevan a pensar de manera crítica, a cuestionarnos a nosotros mismos y a cuestionar al mundo y a quienes nos rodean. Nos llevan a imaginar caminos posibles de transformación, a pensar en las desigualdades, en las inequidades del mundo en las que vivimos. Ya sea que hable de feminismos, de teoría queer, de exclusiones y marginalidades, del sistema, de filosofía política o de ética, su pensamiento siempre es brillante, agudo y propositivo. Judith Butler, quien nació en 1956 en Cleveland, Ohio, en el seno de una familia judía, es profesora de filosofía de los departamentos de retórica y de literatura comparada en la Universidad de California en Berkeley. Pensadora y activista. Textos como El género en disputa, Cuerpos que importan o Deshacer el género resultan fundamentales para el feminismo y para la teoría queer. En tanto, parten de una lectura de nuestro mundo actual y sus políticas y biopolíticas excluyentes en términos de género. Su propuesta de la performatividad del género y la sexualidad propició la reflexión en torno a los feminismos encerrados dentro de los parámetros hegemónicos, una línea del feminismo liberal, blanca, de clase media y fundamentalmente heteronormada, y propuso frente a esto las identidades nómadas, así como las bases de nuevos movimientos contra la discriminación y la opresión. Desde su formación postestructuralista, ha trabajado también en torno a la relación entre ética y política, tratando de entender las exclusiones que el capitalismo ha provocado. En esta línea se encuentran obras como Contingencia, Hegemonía, Universalidad, realizadas por Ernesto Laclau y Sisek, Lenguaje, Poder e Identidad o Vida Precaria. Como lo comenté al comienzo, poder escucharla hoy es un absoluto privilegio. Disfrutémosla. What is an inhabitable world? What does it mean to live a livable life? These are two different questions. The first asserts the world as primary, asking what the world should be and how it can be inhabited by human and non-human creatures. The second asserts a distinction between a life that is livable and one that is unlivable. When we speak about the world, we are already speaking about inhabitation. It would be different if we were speaking about the earth. The earth persists in many places without being inhabited by humans, but a world is always a space of inhabitation, a time of inhabitation. A world is in some sense the temporal and spatial coordinates in which a life is lived. If the world is uninhabitable, even then destruction has had its way with the world. If a life is unlivable, then the conditions of livability have been destroyed. The destruction of the earth through climate change makes for an uninhabitable world and reminds us of the limits of inhabitation. There are better and worse ways for humans to inhabit the world. And sometimes the world can only survive if limits are put on the reach of human habitation. The limits imposed on the human make for a habitable world under conditions of climate change. A life proves not to be livable if the world is not inhabitable. So to inhabit a world is part of what makes a life livable. If we as humans inhabit the earth without regard for biodiversity, without stopping climate change, without limiting carbon emissions, then we produce for ourselves an uninhabitable world. A world may not be the same as the earth, but if we destroy the earth, we also destroy our worlds. And if we live human lives with no limits on our freedom, then we enjoy our freedom at the expense of a livable life. We make our own lives unlivable in the name of our freedom. 
or rather we make our world uninhabitable and our lives unlivable in the name of a personal liberty that values itself over all other values and that becomes an instrument in the destruction of social bonds and livable worlds. Without entering into the question of whether the pandemic is a direct or indirect effect of climate change, I believe it is important to draw attention to the fact that we are living in a pandemic global condition in the midst of climate change. And that means that our relation to air, water, shelter, and food, which was already compromised under the conditions of climate change, is even more acutely registered under the conditions of pandemic. These are two different conditions, but they become overdetermined and condensed in this pandemic present. On the one hand, the cessation of travel and ec economic activity allows the sea and air to recover from protracted contamination by environmental toxins. So we glimpse what environmental renewal or repair might be. But on the other hand, do we have any guarantee that this will be anything more than a passing moment? After all, it was not from concern for the environment that travel and production were cut back. No, it was from fear that humans could contract the virus on planes and in workplaces. So it was the human-centered reasons that remained central. Nothing about the Anthropocene has yet been contested. And yet the pandemic illuminates how the natural wor world could regenerate if production were cut back, if travel were curtailed, and carbon emissions and carbon footprints diminished. I speak to you now by recording because I cannot fly to Mexico City, but perhaps this experience also lets me know that if I were to travel less, the natural world would have a greater chance of repair. Not just me, but every me who has taken travel for granted or who cannot live without travel or believe they cannot live without travel. If the lesson indirectly learned from the pandemic is that we, we must all diminish our carbon footprints, then it follows that in the post-pandemic, we must calculate carbon footprints in order to secure for ourselves and others a future of an inhabitable world. Of course, the question of a livable life seems at first to be a narrowly subjective question. We ask, what will make my life livable? What are the conditions that must be met for me to live a livable life? To say that a life is livable is to say that I can live it and presumably that others can as well, that my life understood as a human life can live under certain conditions and that those conditions pertain to other lives as well. That the restrictions under which I live are not so unbearable that I no longer believe that I can continue with this life. Of course, humans have different experiences of the limit of liv livability. And whether or not a set of restrictions are livable depends on how one gauges the requirements of one's life. Livability is in the end a modest requirement. One is not, for instance, asking what will make me happy, nor is one asking what kind of life would most clearly satisfy my desires. One is looking rather to live in such a way that life itself remains bearable, livable. In other words, one is looking for those requirements of a life that would allow a life to continue. Another way of saying this would be, what are the conditions of life that make possible the desire to live, to continue to live? For we surely know that under some conditions of restriction, incarceration, occupation, detention, torture, statelessness, one can be led to ask the question, is life worth living under these conditions? And in some cases, the very de desire to live can be extinguished. People do take their lives, or they let themselves die, or they find themselves dying under the power of others. 
The pandemic poses this question for us, I think, in a different way. For the restrictions under which I'm asked to live are those that protect not just my own life, but the lives of others as well. The restrictions stop me from acting in certain ways, but they also lay out a vision of the world that I am asked to accept. If they were to speak, they would ask me to understand this life that I live as bound up with other lives and to regard this being bound up with one another as a fundamental feature of who I am. In other words, I am unable to come to Mexico City because of restrictions that seek to protect me from a virus that could take my life, but also restrain me from communicating a virus that I may not know that I have and that could take the lives of others. In other words, I am asked not to die and not to put others at risk of illness or death. And I have to decide whether or not to agree with that request. To understand both parts of that request, I have to see myself as capable of communicating the virus, but also as someone who can be infected by the virus. I am an agent, but I am vulnerable. I am powerful and I am exposed. I'm able to cause harm and I am subject to being harmed. There is no escape from either end of that polarity. It seems as if I am bound up with others through the prospect of doing or suffering harm, and even my life and their lives depend upon a recognition of how our lives depend uh, on how each of us acts. I am perhaps used to acting on my own behalf and deciding whether and how a consideration of others comes into play. But in the paradigm I'm sketching for you today, I am already in relation to you and you are already in relation to me way before either of us starts to deliberate on how best to relate to one another. We share air and surfaces. We brush up against each other. We are strangers near each other on the plane, and the package I wrap may be the one that you open. We act, or sometimes act, as if our separate lives come first, and then we decide on our social arrangements. That is a liberal conceit that underwrites a great deal of moral philosophy. But when and how did my life become imaginable as a separate life? What were the conditions that gave rise to that kind of imagination? The question of food and sleep and shelter were never separable from the question of my life, its livability, and those provisions must have been there even if minimally for me to begin to imagine a separate I. That dependency had to be put aside, if not fully denied, for me to decide that I am a singular individual closed off from others, separate, and yet all individuation is haunted by a dependency that is imagined as if it could be overcome. The pandemic brings that home as well, how to live without touch or being touched, without the shared breath. Is that livable? If my life is from the start only ambiguously my own, then the field of interdependency, social interdependency, is there from the start prior to any deliberation on moral conduct. The question, what should I do? How do I live this life? These presuppose an I and a life that poses that question on its own and for itself. But if the I is always populated and life is always shared, then how do those moral questions change? Still, it's difficult to shake the presumption of an individual and finite life. After all, what makes a life livable seems to be a personal question, one that pertains to this life and not any other one. And yet, when I ask what makes a life livable, I imply that there are some shared conditions that make human lives livable then at least some part of what makes my own life livable makes another life livable as well. And I cannot fully dissociate the question of my own well-being from the well-being of others. 
If the pandemic gives us one rather large social and ethical lesson to learn, this seems to be it. What makes a life livable can be a question that a social agency poses or a government. It's a question that implicitly shows us that the life we live is never exclusively our own, that the conditions for a livable life have to be secured and not just for me. Those conditions cannot be grasped, for instance, through the category of private property. The I who I am is also to some extent a we, though tensions tend to define the relation of these two senses of one's life. If it is this life that is mine, it seems to be mine. But if life is never fully my own, well, if life names a condition and trajectory that is shared, then life is the place where I lose my self-centeredness. In fact, the phrase, my life, tends to pull in two directions at once. This life, singular, irreplaceable. This life, shared and human, shared as well with, with animal lives and with various systems and networks of life. Now, I'm certainly not arguing that the pandemic is good because it's teaching us lessons of the kind we need to learn. Rather, I'm saying that certain conditions of life and living are laid bare by the circulation of the virus and that we now have a chance to grasp our relations to the earth and to each other in sustaining ways, to understand ourselves less as separate entities driven by self-interest than as complexly bound together in a living world full of challenges. Whether or not we do so is a matter for debate. I'm not of the view that the pandemic will open a utopian future, but neither do I believe that it will lead to a dystopia. I think that the terms of the struggle are made more acute and that a renewed collective commitment to social and economic equality should follow from these new insights into the ways that we are bound up with one another. As we know, the pandemic takes place both in the context of climate change and environmental destruction, but it also takes place in the context of a form of capitalism that continues to treat the lives of workers as dispensable. For some of us, there is health insurance and safety measures in the workplace, social welfare, but for the vast majority of people, there is no health insurance and the effort to secure health care is a struggle which too often fails. So when we ask in the US whose lives are most imperiled by the pandemic, we find that it is the poor, the black community, the recent migrants, the incarcerated and the elderly. As the businesses reopen and industry restarts, there's no way to protect so many workers from the virus. And for populations that never had access to health care or who were disadvantaged by racism, illnesses that once could have been treated become pre-existing conditions and make them more vulnerable to illness and to death. For those who believe that the health of the economy is more important than the health of the population, well, they follow a formula that claims that profit and wealth is finally more important than human life. Those who are calculating the risks, who know <clears throat> that some will have to die, conclude either implicitly or explicitly that human life will be sacrificed for the economy. We, we might argue, hey, the industry and workplaces have to stay open for the sake of the working poor. But if it is precisely the working poor whose lives will be sacrificed at the workplace where the infection rates are highest, then we have a newer version of Marx's understanding of labor. We open the economy or keep it open in order to sustain the lives of the working poor but it is the working poor themselves whose lives are deemed dispensable and whose work can be replaced by other workers. In other words, under the conditions of pandemic, the worker goes to work in order to live, but work is precisely what hastens the worker's death. The worker discovers her dispensability and replaceability for it is the health of the economy that is more important than the health of the worker. So an old contradiction that belongs to capitalism 
assumes a new form under pandemic conditions, or what we could call pandemic capitalism. And now we have to ask whether we would want to live in such a world, whether such a world that makes the distinction between lives that are worth saving and lives that are not is really inhabitable. Whose lives are considered valuable as lives and whose are not? What may appear as an abstract philosophical question turns out to be one that emerges from the heart of a social and epidemiological emergency. For the world to be inhabitable, it must support not only the conditions of life, but the desire to live itself. And who wants to live in a world that despises or dispenses with one's life? To want to live in such a world is to take up the struggle against those conditions that seek one's death. One cannot do that alone, but only through a struggle, a collaborative struggle that forms a new condition for loving and for desire. And for a life to be livable, it has to be an embodied life, able to inhabit spaces that seek to orchestrate and further that life, not its illness, not its death. And those spaces include home, shelter, workplace, the store, the street, the field, the public square. As new scientific research on vaccines and antivirals start to report on their progress, the market is busy batting on the futures of this or that pharmacological industry. If a vaccine becomes available, who will get it first and what will it cost? Will it be freely distributed at no profit? And will those most in need be the first to receive it? The question of social equality enters into the question of the distribution of these drugs, and we shall see whether global collaboration triumphs over nationalism and market interests. We must struggle for a world in which we defend the rights to health care for the stranger on the far side of the world as fervently as we do for our neighbor or our lover. That may seem unreasonable, but perhaps it is time that we take apart the local and nationalist bias that pervades our idea of the reasonable. Recently, the World Health Organization director, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, stated, and I quote, none of us can accept a world in which some people are protected while others are not, end quote. He was calling for an end to nationalism and an end to the market rationality that would calculate um, which lives are more worth saving than others. If we refuse this choice, that means that we will be committed to global forms of collaboration and support that seek to ensure equal access to health care, to a livable life. I've not exactly answered the question of what makes a life livable or a world inhabitable, but the life worlds in which we live have to be those that not only further our own lives, but secure the conditions of life for all creatures whose desire to live should be equally honored. To refuse to make that choice, who will live, who will die, is to confront the market-driven calculation that would force us to make that choice. Only a global commitment honors the global interdependency in which we live. At the moment, that interdependency can seem fatal, but it is, in the end, the possibility we have for equality and for building and sustaining a livable world. Tal como lo comentamos al inicio, las ideas de Judith Butler transforman nuestra manera de mirar al mundo. En este caso, su intervención centrada en las relaciones que nos lleva a establecer la pandemia con el mundo con el que vivimos, con nosotros mismos en tanto individuos y con la comunidad que nos rodea, así como con las consecuencias de estos, de estos tipos de relaciones, pone en tensión los vínculos entre libertad y seguridad, entre control y responsabilidad, entre individualismo y sociedad, y entre justicia y desarrollo capitalista. ¿Qué significado podríamos darle a la pandemia en un contexto de cambio climático, 
de destrucción del planeta propiciada por el valor otorgado a las ganancias económicas por sobre el equilibrio de la naturaleza y por sobre el cuidado a la salud o el respeto a las condiciones de vida de la gente, el confinamiento nos brinda hoy la oportunidad de pensar cómo transformar este mundo en un mundo verdaderamente habitable para todas y para todos. Cómo hacer posible que la vida sea una vida habitable, tanto desde la parte de mi existencia, que es solo mía, como desde aquella que comparto con los demás. Realmente querríamos vivir en un mundo en el que haya seres humanos que merezcan ser salvados mientras otros están condenados desde su origen, sin duda estamos eligiendo no morir, dice Butler. Estamos encerrados en casa los que podemos hacerlo. ¿Y los demás? ¿Cuáles son las condiciones que permiten el deseo de vida? ¿Cuáles son los cuerpos que quedan excluidos de estas, los excluidos del sistema, los sin trabajo, o que, o que tienen muy bajas remuneraciones, los que no tienen seguridad social que los proteja, los que no tienen viviendas dignas, sin acceso a la educación? Son las vidas precarias. ¿De verdad seguiremos viviendo como si la pandemia no hubiera sucedido, contribuyendo por acción o omisión a la destrucción del planeta? ¿O seremos capaces de crear como personas, como comunidades y como naciones compromisos de apoyo y de colaboración, priorizando la vida por sobre el lucro? De algún modo, la participación de Judith Butler nos lleva a pensar en nuestro papel ante lo que nos espera el momento de volver a esa nueva normalidad, extraño símbolo de la que han empezado ya a hablarnos. Gracias, Judith Butler, por darnos este tiempo de reflexión a la UNAM. Thank you.